Welcome back. It's time for lesson 31 and 32. What you see in front of you is a three-dimensional representation of two stationary states interfering with one another in the hydrogen atom. This is where we're about to go. But we're not quite there yet. So let's start more or less back at the beginning. Um, we're going to pick up where we left off last time when we talked about the Schrodinger wave equation in three dimensions. Last time we talked about what happens if we use Cartesian coordinates to separate the Schrodinger wave equation into pieces. This time we're going to use spherical polar coordinates. We're going to do that because the potential in many cases depends only on R. And so it is easiest to break the wave function up into pieces that depend on R, theta, and phi. So here's the kinetic energy operator acting on the wave function in spherical polar coordinates. Notice there's a piece that's got derivatives with respect to r, there's a piece that's got derivatives with respect to theta, and one piece that's got derivatives with respect to phi. The theta and phi part turn out to have to do with angular momentum, and the uh, r part has to do with radial momentum, the momentum in, toward, and away from the center of force. Now we can convert this into the Schrodinger wave equation by simply adding the potential energy times the wave function and setting that equal to the energy eigenvalue times the wave function. This is the eigenvalue equation for the Schrodinger wave equation written out in spherical polar coordinates. Now, our plan is to separate the wave function into pieces. Just as we did in, in one-dimensional quantum mechanics when we had the time-dependent Schrodinger equation, we factored the wave function into a time part and a space part. The separation constant in that case was the energy, and that's how we got the energy on the right-hand side of this equation. That's the separation constant that helped us to separate the wave function into a time part and a space part. But now the space part has three variables, so we're going to separate again. We're going to rewrite the wave function as a product of an r part, a theta part, and a phi part. And if I plug all that back in, I get this monstrosity. Now what I want you to do is to focus just on the kinetic energy term for a second. Let's move it to the top. And let's see what happens when we go ahead and take some of these derivatives. So for example, if we take the first r derivative, the first theta derivative, and the first phi, we can take both phi derivatives, in fact, since it's a second phi derivative, you can see that things simplify a little bit. What I want to do now is to uh, see what happens when I factor out the pieces that I didn't take derivatives of. So let's separate things a little bit. We'll take the phi and the theta out of the r prime term. We'll take the r and the phi out of the theta prime term. And we'll take the r and the theta out of the phi double prime term. Now what I want to do next is to multiply everything by 2 mu r squared over h bar squared. Remember mu is the reduced mass of the electron and the proton in this case. And I'm going to divide through everything by r theta phi. Let's see what we get. Notice that um, now the parts that depend on r are separate from the parts that depend on theta and phi. This is really cool because it means um, I have a function of r plus a function of theta and phi equals 0. Now we talked about this in class, but Anytime you have a function of one variable plus a function of a different variable equals zero, those functions are in fact constants. They can't be anything else. And you can persuade yourself of that. We talked about it in class. But uh, you can persuade yourself of that pretty easily if you try sticking in one value for one of the variables and then look at what the other thing, say we set r equal to 3. Now we have 3 plus a function of theta and phi equals zero. Well, that means that function of theta and phi is minus 3. It has to be. And uh, it works out the same way if you choose a theta and phi. Uh, the function of r has to be a constant, and so on. So we're going to call the function of r l times l plus 1. Now that's kind of a strange name for a constant. But it turns out that that is a useful name for a constant because l ends up being an integer, we'll discover. Uh, and that means that g of theta and phi has to be minus l times l plus 1 because they have to add up to 0. So they have to be negatives of one another. Now, if I put in that the thing on the right, the function of theta and phi, is equal to minus l times l plus 1, it means that 
if I add L times L plus 1 to that function of theta and phi, I have to get 0. Now what I can do is get rid of the theta in the phi term and uh, multiply by uh, sine squared theta through the whole expression. And notice that now I've got a function of theta only times a function of phi only. Again, just as it was before, these each have to be constants. And I, the, for this time, I'm going to choose the constant to be m squared for the function of theta and minus m squared for the function of phi. This is just the strategy of factoring the uh, wave function into pieces that each depend only on one variable and then I, uh, inventing separation constants that allow us to solve the equations. We're choosing separation constants with the knowledge of the answer. <laughs> so we already know the answer. So we're picking the separation constants in kind of a weird way, but there it's a weird way that proves to be useful. So if you rewrite the phi part, you'll notice it's, uh, it's actually just the second derivative of phi is equal to minus m squared times phi again. This is obviously just the plain old solutions we've been working with, e to the i m phi. Um, m, it turns out, has to be an integer. Why is that? Well, if I add 2 pi to phi, I get e to the i m phi plus 2 pi, but that's e to the i m phi times e to the i m 2 pi. Now, one thing about space is if you go around and end up back where you started, you should be, uh, you should have the same wave function. And so in order to keep the wave function single valued, in other words, if it has the same value at phi and phi plus 2 pi, then it turns out e to the i m 2 pi has to be 1. Now, uh, that means m has to be an integer, and that means that uh, m has to be 0, plus or minus 1, plus or minus 2, like that. Okay? So, uh, what's the next equation? It's this, uh, the theta part. Now, we go ahead and put back in what phi double prime over phi is, and multiply through by theta, we get this monstrosity. Now, I'm not going to solve this one. It turns out uh, it's done in Griffith's Electromagnetics book, I think, and it's done in many other places. But this equation has well-known solutions. They're called the associated Legendre functions, and they're related to the Legendre polynomials. Um, these functions are defined uh, in this way. It's the mth, absolute value of mth derivative of the, the lth Legendre polynomial times the m over 2th root of um, 1 minus x squared. And uh, the Legendre polynomials are defined this way as the lth derivative of x squared minus 1 to the l divided by 2 to the l times l factorial. You know, it's a terrible uh, monstrosity. But the point is, if you just use these two definitions as a machine to compute these functions, you can do it. So I wrote a little program that does that. And I computed a whole pile of these things. And you can see they're functions of theta. Um, they are, uh, there's some in there. Let's see, there's, you notice there's a square root of 1 minus cosine squared. If my program were smarter, it would replace that with sine of theta. And uh, 1 minus cosine squared uh, is sine squared of theta, and so on. But uh, you get the idea. These are just a pile of functions of theta. and uh, and there's no phi anywhere in sight because these are functions of theta only. But they get kind of complicated as the numbers go higher. But it's straightforward to compute them if, if uh, a little tedious. Now we define the spherical harmonics as the product of the associated Legendre functions times the solutions to the phi part, the e to the i m phi, and a normalization factor. Now the normalization factor is just there so that when you integrate over all theta and all phi using the correct normalization for theta and phi, you end up with uh, with functions that are orthonormal. That is, y m l squared integrated over all angles is 1, and y m l times a different y m l gives you 0. The normalization constant is a little scary to look at, but it's, uh, it's computable, at least, and you can uh, work with it, so it's not, it's not terrible. If you, again, write a program to generate a bunch of these guys, you'll see that they come out, uh, you know, it get, it, they're fairly ugly, but uh, this is for all the positive m's. Um, there's a simple symmetry relationship that gives you the negative m's. 
but uh, there they are. You can tabulate them. You certainly don't want to try to memorize any of these guys, um, <clears throat> but uh, they're listed in tables and textbooks and manuals and so on, so they're easy to get. Let's jump back to the radial part. So that's the theta part. Now, notice we didn't have to deal with the potential at all to get the theta and the phi part. The theta and the phi part are the same for any potential that depends only on R. So uh, that means they apply to all different kinds of atoms and molecules. As long as the interaction potential only depends on R, you can use those guys uh, right out of the box. Okay, back to the radial equation. Now the radial equation does have a potential in it. And so in order to solve this for um, the hydrogen atom, for example, we're going to have to stick in some definite potential. But I want you to notice that when I go ahead and take the other derivatives, I can simplify my life by making a substitution. The substitution we're going to make is that u of r is defined to be r times capital R. Now capital R is the r part of the wave function. u of r is called the radial wave function. And uh, we can just substitute uh, u of r over r in for big R. And if you look at what r prime is, and you look at what r double prime is, uh, we actually did this on the board last time, so you guys should remember how this all goes. You plug all that back in, and you get the following result. There's a u double prime, there's a v minus e term, there's an l times l plus 1 term. Um, if we keep working on that a little bit and rearrange, you get the following result. And if you multiply by r on both sides, you get this result. And this is interesting because if you look at it, you'll notice that it looks exactly like one-dimensional quantum mechanics with a single extra term. There's minus h bar squared over 2 mu u, u double prime. There's the potential times u. And then there's this one extra term that has to do with the magnitude of the angular momentum. This is the centripetal force term or the centripetal potential term that shows up in classical mechanics, if you solve exactly the same problem, and uh, it just acts like an added effective potential that uh, that a acts in the R direction. Okay, and uh, other than that, it looks like one-dimensional quantum mechanics. Now there is a special case when L is equal to zero; that centripetal potential term goes away, and you just get straightforward one-dimensional quantum mechanics. So, interesting case if we want to solve the hydrogen atom, we simply put in the actual potential, the Coulomb potential, and we get this follow the following thing. It's a terrible monster, but, uh, but that's our problem. We want to solve the hydrogen atom. Now, uh, it almost always pays to look at asymptotic behavior when you're solving a problem like this. So let's look at two different domains. Let's look at small r and large r. If you look at large r, you'll notice that the Coulomb term and the centripetal or centrifugal potential term become negligibly small at very large r. And so you end up with uh, what looks like the outside of the finite square well. Basically, you've got minus h bar squared over 2 mu u double prime is equal to e times mu. This is uh, what we had when we were outside the potential well with the finite square well in one dimension. And the solution should not be too shocking turns out to be exactly the same. You'll notice that uh, it goes like e to the minus kappa r. Now r goes to infinity, so you, technically you could also have a e to the plus kappa r, but of course that blows up as r gets large, and so in the large r limit that term is going to be negligible. So for large r we have to have a, a decreasing exponential. Okay. Now what about small r? When you have small r, then the Coulomb potential doesn't matter anymore because the centrifugal potential is going to overwhelm it since it goes like 1 over r squared. And so in that domain, we could just ignore the energy term, ignore the Coulomb potential term, and just make sure that the second derivative term and the 1 over r squared term uh, line up with each other to make the equation satisfied. And you can see that uh, if you let u be some power of r, and you plug that in, you end up with the condition that uh, q times q minus 1 is equal to l times l plus 1. Now there's only two solutions to that. The two solutions, just plug into the quadratic formula, are either l, r to the l plus 1 or 
r to the minus l. Now the problem is for, uh, for small r, r to the minus l blows up. So the only answer that actually physically could work is the r to the l plus 1. So we got the small r and the large r limits taken care of, but we haven't dealt with the middle yet. So the idea is to factor the u function into the small r piece times the large r piece times some kind of function that's going to take up the uh, slack in the intermediate areas. So we've kind of sort of factored out the asymptotic behavior for small r and large r. And what's left over, we hope we can get a simpler differential equation to try to solve. Um, if we plug all that back in and substitute into the radial equation, we uh, we get a recursion relation. We can de we can demand that v be writable as a, as an infinite sum uh, polynomial, uh, and uh, we get a recursion relation. But it's interesting. It's a recursion relation that gives us the positive exponential if we follow it through, unless um, the thing terminates. So the point is, in order for the thing to terminate, e has to have a particular value. And that turns out to be how E becomes quantized. E becomes quantized by demanding that the wave function we wind up with is physically reasonable, which means it doesn't blow up as R goes to infinity. And there are only a certain set of E values that make that possible. Remember, E is related to kappa. So kappa values, E values are all connected. And uh, turns out that those E values that work are the ones you're familiar with. 13.6 um, volts divided by n squared. So actually negative 13.6 volts divided by n squared. And uh, it's sort of like when we had the simple harmonic oscillator, you may remember that we had to stop the series solution for the simple harmonic oscillator when we did it using the analytical approach in order to keep the thing from blowing up. It's the same basic idea. Once you have energy, of course, that gives you kappa. It also defines uh, what we call A. A is the Bohr radius. It turns out to be about half an angstrom. And uh, it also determines the value of this uh, function V. Now the V functions turn out to be polynomials. If you snoop through the literature on various special polynomial functions, you'll find that in fact it's a very old function that was discovered a long time ago. They're called the Laguerre polynomials. And they are computed this way. This is the associated Laguerre polynomial. And uh, they're defined similar to the Legendre polynomials based on the Laguerre polynomials. And the Laguerre polynomials are derivatives of exponentials times powers of x. And again, this is a recipe you can use to build these guys. It's a bunch of special functions. I wrote a little program to build a pile of them. And I came up with this list. You can see that they are. Uh, there are polynomials uh, in x. And uh, of course, x, remember, is r over na. So um, if you plug all this back in, you get the following terrible mess. You get wave functions, which are uh, exponentials that decay with r. You have r to the power l. You have the Laguerre polynomial times the spherical harmonics. And remember, the spherical harmonics are products of Legendre-associated polynomials times uh, complex exponentials in phi. So if you put in all the dependents, this thing would be a terrible mess. But I want to factor some of this out and just look at it. We've got some kind of normalization constant. We've got r to the l. We've got a polynomial in r. And we've got the spherical harmonics. And then, of course, there's the exponential decay in r. If you put all that in, you'll see that, in fact, it's the product of r stuff times the spherical harmonics. And uh, all the angular dependence is in the spherical harmonics. The small r and large r dependence we worked out before uh, separating out the v polynomials is still there in the final solution. And the structure in the r direction is all given by the Laguerre polynomials. So, And we're going to see that in a minute. Let's actually look at some of these functions using the 3D visualization strategy that I cooked up for the purposes of this set of slides. Okay. Okay, so before we get started, 
I want to describe for you how these pictures work. These are visualizations of three-dimensional wave functions. And uh, the problem, of course, we have all three dimensions are used up in real space. So we have to represent the wave function somehow separately from space. So one issue is the phase of the wave function. To get that, I'm using color. So you've seen that done before, so that's not anything new. The other question is the amplitude of the wave function. And you'll notice there are a collection of little dots out there, little spheres. These spheres are uh, sized in such a way that their radius is proportional to the amplitude of the wave function. Now they're capped so that they can never get smaller than a certain size, even if the amplitude goes to zero. And they're also capped at the other end so they can never get bigger than a certain size, even if the amplitude becomes very large. But they have another feature that makes them interesting, and that is that they move around. They move around because they're attracted to regions of high probability. So they tend to congregate in those areas where the probability of being there is large, and they tend to avoid areas where the probability of being there is small. Now, obviously, there's a little bit of thermal agitation and so on that goes on, but that's the basic idea. So here's the 100 eigenstate. And here's the, uh, this is what the 200 eigenstates look like. This is a freeze frame. I wanted you to notice uh, that in the 100 state, the f color was changing. That was simply the phase. It was a, uh, an energy eigenstate, so everything changed color at the same time, which only makes sense because the whole thing is in phase. This case is a little different because you'll notice that the interior part of the wave function is green, but the outer part is red. And that's a consequence of the fact that the radio wave function goes through a zero and changes phase. So we have two different parts in space. At a given snapshot in time, different parts of space have different phases. And this becomes important when it comes time to finding superposition wave functions where you add states together. Now see what happens as we turn on the time. Okay, here's the 211 state. This is a state of uh, one unit of angular momentum, and notice that the phase now varies continuously around the z-axis. If you watch the thing go in time, you'll notice that it's spinning in such a way that it would normally have a plus one, a plus component of angular momentum. Let's see what happens. So there it goes. Now also notice there's no probability at the center. That's the r to the l. And here's the two one minus one state. Looks the same, but it spins the other way around. Here's the 320 state. Notice the phase. And here's the 322 state. Notice that this time the phase goes two full cycles around the z-axis, corresponding to two units of angular momentum. I've got a couple of quick superpositions to show. Here's the 211 plus 21 minus 1 plus 100. Notice that this one shows a significant variation in dipole moment. This is a sloshing superposition. And I've got another one similar to that. This is a 320 plus a 211. So notice that it looks like there's a charge sort of circling the origin. And uh, this also produces a varying time time dependent dipole moment. OK, let's talk about orbital angular momentum. Remember, orbital angular momentum classically is defined as r cross p. and uh, Mathematically, you can define that in terms of a uh, determinant of the unit vectors, the position vector, and the momentum vector. And the components of the angular momentum, the orbital angular momentum, are defined thusly. And uh, the question is, these different components of angular momentum, are they compatible observables? In other words, can I observe the x component of angular momentum and the y component of angular momentum at the same time. Sort of like I can observe x and y at the same time. I can observe y and z at the same time. What about angular momentum? Well, it turns out because the angular momentum is a mixture of momentum and position, and momentum and position are incompatible observables. If you try to measure two components of the angular momentum, you run into trouble. So for board work, we're going to work out today the um, commutator of Lx and Ly. What I want you to do, if you're listening to the slide uh, 
If you're listening to these slides and you're not going to actually see me in class, I would like you to try to work it out on your own, but you know, email me or let me know if you have trouble, and we'll see if we can't get you going. The answer turns out to be that it's proportional to LZ. That is LZ, uh, that the commutator of X and Y is not zero. They do interfere with each other. And shockingly, the interference is proportional to LZ. Now you can generate commutator of LY and LZ by just cyclically rotating these guys. So LY comma LZ, the commutator is IH bar LX and LZ LX is IH bar LY. So they're cyclical. Um, they, you can get the rest of them by doing cyclical rotations of X, Y, and Z. Now it turns out, uh, we could also show this, but we don't have time, but it's easy enough to show that the L squared operator does commute with LX, LY, and LZ. So those commutators are all zero. Um, what that means is you can, at any one moment, know the total angular momentum and any one component of angular momentum, but not the other two, because the other two interfere with the first, and so you can't know any two components of angular momentum at the same time. But you can know one component and the total angular momentum at any given moment. Now you may remember with this uh, simple harmonic oscillator, we uh, define these raising and lowering operators, and so uh, we're going to do that again. We're going to define L plus and L minus as linear combinations of LX and LY. <coughs> now, um, let's work out the commutator of LZ and L plus minus. Well, the definition of L plus minus is LX plus minus ILY. So the commutator of LZ and L plus minus is just the commutator of LZ and LX plus I times the commutator of LZ and LY. Of course, we know those from the equation at the top of the screen. So we can put in the results, and you'll notice that uh, what that says is LZ does not commute with L plus and L minus, but the commutator, interestingly, is plus minus H bar L plus minus. So there's a relationship between uh, L plus minus. It's, it, it is its own commutator with LZ, which has interesting consequences. Let's imagine we have a state. Because L squared and LZ commute with each other, it should be possible to find a single state that is a simultaneously an eigenvector of L squared and LZ. So let's suppose we have such a state. Let's call it lambda mu. It has an L squared eigenvalue of lambda, <coughs> and it has an LZ eigenvalue of mu. So mu tells you the Z component of angular momentum. Lambda tells you the uh, magnitude of the angular momentum squared. And uh, remembering that these guys commute with each other, um, we should be able to see what happens if I ask for the L squared eigenvalue of a state, which you get by applying L plus and minus to a state of well-known L squared and LZ eigenvalue. So what do we get? Um, well, it turns out since L squared and LZ or L plus minus commute, then uh, we can operate on either either order. So if we operate with L squared first, we get out of lambda, and so that tells us that uh, a state which we get by applying L plus and minus uh, it has the same value of its L squared eigenvalue that it had before. So what that means is. Um, if we apply plus and minus, L plus minus to a state of well-known L squared and LZ eigenvalue, we get a state that has the same L squared eigenvalue as I had before. Now, what if we apply LZ to a state that has a well-known L squared and LZ eigenvalue? Well, I can, uh, I can subtract off L plus minus LZ and add L plus minus LZ, and I still get the same state still got the same operator, I've just subtracted and added the same thing. But notice the trick there is that the first two terms in that sum are nothing other than the LZ L plus minus commutator. So I can put in what I know the LZ L plus minus commutator is, it's plus minus H bar L plus minus. But now H bar is just a number. And if you look at the second term, you'll notice that we've swapped L plus minus and LZ. So now LZ is acting on lambda mu, but that is just uh, mu times lambda mu. And so I can uh, now I have L plus minus 
plus or minus h bar are plus minus. The plus or minus h bar and the mu are both just numbers, so I can factor those out. And I get the interesting result that the LZ eigenvalue of the state you get after you apply L plus minus to a state of well-known L squared and LZ is uh, mu plus or minus h bar times the same state. In other words, what you've got now is an eigenstate of LZ with an eigenvalue for LZ that's either h bar greater or h bar less than you started with. So that's the idea. If you, uh, if you hit one of these states with L plus, you get a state whose LZ eigenvalue is mu plus h bar. And if you hit it with L minus, you get a state whose LZ eigenvalue is mu minus h bar. So it leaves the L squared eigenvalue the same, but it adds or subtracts h bar from the LZ eigenvalue. What good is that? Um, that's good because it means we can play interesting games. Uh, one thing is we know there has to be a limit. You can't keep increasing the LZ component without changing the magnitude of L without eventually running into a problem because there's no way the Z component of angular momentum can ever be greater than the magnitude of the angular momentum. And so there's some maximum value of mu that can't, uh, where you can't go any higher. And so the idea is if you apply L plus to that state, you ought to get zero. And similarly, there should be a minimum value, a most negative value of mu below which you can't go for the same reason. It's kind of like in the uh, simple harmonic oscillator, when we hit the lowering operator on the ground state, we got nothing. Here, if we hit L plus on a state that has the maximum Z component of angular momentum, we get nothing. If we hit L minus on a state that has the minimum value of z component of angular momentum, we should get nothing as well. So uh, let's imagine that we hit uh, this state. Let's imagine we have a state that has the maximum value. And we hit it on with LZ. We should get an angular momentum times the maximum back again. We're going to define h bar L to be that maximum. So this L, it turns out it's going to be the same L we ran into when we did the separation of variables. Um, of course, L squared acting on that maximum state is going to give us lambda um, times that maximum state again. And uh, now it turns out it's easy to show that if you take the L plus minus operator and hit the L minus plus, that means L plus on L minus or L minus on L plus, you get L squared minus LZ squared plus or minus H bar LZ. So you can, sh you can show this with algebra. Griffiths does it. It's easy to do. Just put in the definitions of L plus and L minus and fiddle around. Um, you can run that backwards and solve for L squared. L squared is uh, this expression that I've written down there. So let's see where we get with that. Let's apply L squared to this maximum state. Now, I took the upper sign, or no, I'm sorry, the lower sign in the expression on the right at the top. Um, L minus L plus plus LZ squared plus, I got the lower sign, h bar LZ acting on this state should give me lambda times the state back again. But if you look at it, notice that if you hit L plus on the maximum state, you should get nothing. LZ squared gives you an h bar squared L squared, and LZ gives you an h bar squared L. But that also has to be equal to lambda. So that means that uh, lambda has to be h bar squared L times L plus 1. So that tells us how lambda depends on the maximum component of z component of angular momentum. Now let's imagine that there's a minimum. So let's call that value h bar L bar. L bar is the lowest possible uh, the most negative possible value of a z component of angular momentum. And we'll play the same game, but this time I'll take the upper sign from the expression on the upper right hand, and we'll do the same trick, and we'll find that the minimum, uh, that, that L squared, lambda, is also related to the most negative value of the LZ eigenvalue, and those have to be the same. So lambda is lambda, either way. So that means L times L plus 1 has to be the same thing as L bar times L bar minus 1. Now that has two possible solutions. One of them is crazy, and the other one is that L bar is minus L. So what does that say? 
That says that if you apply L plus to the minimum Z component of angular momentum ket n times, you have to get up to the maximum. And it also, uh, since uh, the minimum corresponds to minus L and the maximum corresponds to plus L, it means minus L plus N must be equal to plus L. That means that L has to be an integer N divided by two. So L is a half integer value. And mu is h bar times the m. So you st m starts at negative l, and it goes up to positive l. And the angular momentum associated with each of those states is just h bar times that integer. And, uh, and that's the whole thing. I want you to note that there's no prohibition in this derivation for l to be half integer. Um, so if capital N is an even number, then L will be, uh, I'm sorry, M will uh, be full whole integers, but if capital N is a half integer number, I'm an odd number, excuse me, then M will take on half integer values. So uh, this turns out to be important when we study spin, because spin of many particles turns out to be half integer, like the spin of the electron is a half, and so that uh, actually becomes important. All right, very good. So uh, I hope that wasn't too much. I know that was a lot of material for one day, but uh, that's all there is.